everyone. So welcome back to the Pickwick Club and to Dombey and Son. This is our third monthly meeting on Dombey and Son, and we will meet uh, one more time to finish the novel on May, I think it's the 23rd anyway, the, the fourth Sunday in May. And I'm John Jordan, I'm the, from the Dickens Project, and I'm speaking to you from my home in San Francisco. And uh, I have the very wonderful assistance of Courtney Mahaney, who is the assistant director of the Dickens Project. And she will be helping me to uh, uh, monitor the chat, if there is anything in the chat that uh, I don't see and that needs to be brought to our attention. And if you have questions, please indicate in the raise hand function at the, in the Zoom bar that you would like to ask a question. And Courtney will keep track of uh, order in which people have asked questions. And I'm going to have a, a few preliminary things to say, and, and then uh, I will uh, turn it open to all of you to ask questions. So I'll just remind you of where we are in the novel. We are uh, the reading, the assigned reading for today. I'm, you know, some people may have read farther than that. Some people may have read to the end of the novel. Um, that's okay, but for purposes of discussion, we will not go any farther than chapter 48. So where are we in terms of the, the story, the main story of, um, uh, of Dombey and Son? And uh, you, you may remember that I have said that this novel is really the best organized of the novels that Dickens had written to date. And it falls very neatly into four pretty equal parts. The, the first part ends with the death of little Paul. The second part, the second quarter of the novel, uh, ends with the wedding of Mr. Dombey and Edith. And the third uh, quarter of the novel, which is the one that we're reading today, ends with uh, Florence and Edith leaving the home of Mr. Dombey for separate destinations. So Mr. Dombey discovers that his wife has run away with Mr. Carker and uh, Florence tries in, in vain to, to, to intervene or to, to do something to uh, achieve a reconciliation and Mr. Dombey strikes her, uh, he, he hits her. And I, I must say that it's, um, even though I've read this novel several times, it's been, it's been a few years since I have read it again. And as, as I approached that moment in the text, it was with, with great apprehension. And, and I just, I knew that that moment of domestic violence was about to happen. And it still came as a, terrible shock to me. So uh, I, I, I think this, this, is, this is a novel about domestic life. It's a novel about the family. Um, it's, it's a novel about marriage. And I guess we could say that the, uh, the, the three big chunks of the novel that we have read thus far could be called uh, the first Part, the first quarter of the novel is the story of Paul. And there are other things that are happening, of course, but, but Paul is the main figure and Paul dies at the end of the, the first quarter of the novel. And then the second quarter of the novel is Mr. Dombey's courtship. Uh, much of the plot is devoted to his introduction to Edith Granger, uh, at Leamington Spa, the fashionable resort that he goes to with Major Bagstock. And um, then the third 
quarter of the novel is the marriage. So we have the story of Paul, the story of Mr. Dombey's courtship, and then the story of the marriage. And one of the things that I also believe about this novel that corresponds to this division into four parts is that the novel keeps beginning again. Uh, that when you, at, after the death of, of Paul at, at the end of the first quarter, that the novel has to start over again. So what's going to happen next? And so what happens next is that Mr. Dombey has to find a new wife. And of course, the main reason or one of the main reasons that he wants a new wife is that he wants uh, to have another son. He's got a daughter, but daughters don't count. And so he, um, he's attracted to Edith Granger for many reasons, uh, her, her beauty, her social class, um, and also the fact that she is, um, she has had a child because she was previously married, she's widowed, uh, she had a, not just a child, but a son, and that son is no longer alive. All of these factors make her particularly attractive because if she had a surviving child, a surviving son, that son would be a, a competitor to the son that Mr. Dombey hopes to have as a result of his marriage with, with Edith. Um, it's interesting that that hope is never fulfilled, that Mr. Dombey does not have another child, does not have another son. And that's something we might talk about a little bit. So one of the other things that I, I'd like to just remind you about is uh, what, what I've called the, um, this organizing principle that I think Dickens is using in this novel, which is the, the, uh, the technique of substitution um, or surrogacy is another term to use for that. And what it means is that in this novel, whenever someone disappears from the story, uh, someone else, another character, comes to replace the person who has gone. And that, that technique of substitution begins at the, at the very beginning of the novel when the original or the first Mrs. Dombey dies. And that creates a vacancy or an opening, we could say, in the, the story. And that's a, it's a double opening. Paul has lost his mother, so they need to find a maternal breast to replace the missing mother, and that's polytoodle. So there's the principle of substitution. And then uh, with Mrs. Dombey's death, there's also an opening in the wife slot. So Mr. Dombey is in need of another wife. So this, this principle of substitution, when there's a vacancy, when there's an opening, somebody moves in to fill it. And that just happens all the way through the novel. And uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's fun to track how, how that operates. But there's another principle uh, similar to, to the substitution principle that I think is, is happening in this novel. And uh, it's the, the technique of doubling um, or parallels uh, where you have a situation in one part of the story, and then there's a similar situation in another part of the story. And uh, often uh, the characters involved can be thought of as doubles to each other. So uh, I'm sure you can think of examples of, of that. Uh, it, uh, one of the most obvious is that we have two parallel but also contrasting uh, mother-daughter pairs. So there's um, uh, uh, Mrs. Skewton and Edith. 
and then there is good Mrs. Brown and her daughter, Alice. And in both of those mother-daughter pairings, uh, the mother, there, there's both similarity and difference. The principal difference is the difference in social class. Um, the principal similarity is that in both instances, the mother has mercenary motives and wants to use the daughter uh, for her own selfish purposes. And one of the selfish purposes, the principal social selfish purpose is to connect the daughter with a man, to, to marry the daughter off. So marriage, uh, what mothers do to daughters is, um, is something that is being compared in, in the two uh, parts of the story. And there's an illustration that shows the four figures, the two mother-daughter pairs meeting each other outdoors on the, uh, on, on the, in, the, in the open air. And uh, I'll, I'll show you that, that image because I think uh, it's, uh, it's, we haven't talked about the images, but I've prepared a, a little bit of a slideshow that I wanted to run through uh, with you to show you some of the ways in which the illustrations, the original illustrations, of course, um, are uh, an integral part of the novel. And I, I hope everyone has, either an, a, a penguin edition or another edition that has all of the original illustrations. Or if you don't, if you're reading it online or if you're reading it uh, in a, a, a version that doesn't have all of the illustrations, you can find them easily on the web. Just look up Dombey and Son illustrations. The, probably the easiest place to get them is on a website called the Victorian Web. Um, and that has, gives you access to all of the illustrations for all of Dickens's novels. And it also includes some very interesting and uh, um, valuable commentary on the illustrations uh, as well. So that, that principle of doubling or of parallelism between uh, events and situations and character configurations in one part of the story and another part of the story is, um, it is a principle of organization that Dickens is using. So I, I wanna test this idea on you for just a second. And I wanna, wanna ask you uh, about one of my favorite characters in this entire novel, and that's Mr. Toots. So, um, and those of you who are from the Santa Cruz area will probably know that there was a coffee shop in the little village of Capitola that was called Mr. Toots. And I, I, I remember going there and talking to the server at the, at the cafe and said, do you know why this cafe is called Mr. Toots? And, and the server at that point had no idea. So I had to explain in a little labored fashion <laughs> who Mr. Toots was and, and what a wonderful character he was. But Mr. Toots is one of my all-time favorite characters in, in Dickens' um, novels. And um, so my, my question for you, this is, I'm, I'm asking about the, the questions both of substitution and of parallelism or, or doubling. How does Mr. Toots fit into that organizational principle, either of um, substitution or of doubling or parallelism. Does anyone have any, any thoughts about Mr. Toots? Uh, or, or really, any, I invite any, any kind of response about Mr. Toots, uh, if you just want to say that you, <laughs> you also like Mr. Toots. But yeah, ra raise your hand if, you, if you're interested in Courtney. Uh, please uh, um, call on people, if you would. Phyllis? Oh, hi. Um, well, I guess Mr. Toots is most obviously a, a substitute for the 
presumably drowned Walter um, in his uh, ever so bashful and ever so sweet um, adoration of uh, Florence. Yes. And, um, and I, I, I think you could almost, it might be a stretch that, that Mr. Toots and Susan could be a parallel to uh, Walter and Florence. I mean, a very Shakespearean kind of thing where you have the sort of more nobler, higher characters being echoed by their uh, less, less noble um, servants and helpers. Um, yes. And the other thing that's interesting about Mr. Toots is in the grinder school, I was just, it was just so depressing, you know, them clotted up with Latin and bang, not, bang, banging their shins me, against. It's, it's yes. not the grinder school. It's, oh, no, it's, it's uh, Blimber. the Blimber school. Blimber school. I'm sorry, the Blimber school. <laughs> and, um, and he was a kind of was a depressing casualty of that. But as the story goes on, he becomes aware of what has been done to him. And he's aware he wants to regain some of the humanity that was drummed out of him. And so he's really, he grows so much in the story as well. So it's, it's, and Susan too, she, she gets learned, as you said last time, she, she learns things with Florence. And then she also has her big, you know, stand up against the Pipchins. And um, that's probably all to the good, right? She uh, liberates herself from, yep. from a, yep. yeah. Okay, all of that is is very good. So yes, um, the substitution principle works uh, for Walter. Walter has disappeared, presumably drowned, and um, he was the uh, uh, the prospective lover of Florence. And uh, here is Mr. Toots, who's infatuated with Florence. Um, alas, she rejects him. Um, yes. Any any other comments about Mr. Toots that? Kathy, unmute yourself. Yes, I have to, I have to unmute myself. Yes, um, I, I see some parallels between um, Mr. Toots and Joey Bagstock. Okay, is that both of them are in some ways comic characters, and yet Mr. Toots is the contrast in that he is his intentions are always good, and yes. Joey stocks are always self-focused so in a way he's a substitute and in a way he's the devil okay okay very good i'm also interested in uh mr toots mr toots has has um an employee um the game chicken and i'm i'm interested if people have thoughts about why mr toots has uh, the game chicken around and how that might fit into the, uh, the principle either of doubling or of uh, substitution, so. Peggy? So Mr. Toots is trying to kind of fit into the world and be normal. So he's got the people that make him the clothes and he's got Mr. Toots to teach him how to fight. And that sort of, that's what I see the chicken as doing, is trying to get him to be a young man in that society with the proper behaviors. Okay. Um, and you're, you're right. I mean, the, the game chicken is a prize fighter, right? He's, he, he, the, the game chicken is not his, um, his, his given name, the game chicken is his professional name. It's it's the name under which he uh, he fights, and uh, he, he's he's trying to help Toots to become a stronger person. Um, and he gives him advice. He gives him uh, courtship advice, and his courtship advice is that he should double up Mr. Dombey. Um, he should physically assault Mr. Dombey and beat Mr. Dombey up. Um, well, he's a Neanderthal. <laughs> he's a prize fighter, and you know what he knows is is how to fight. And if you want something, if you want, to, you know, the 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 daughter of a father who uh, seems not ready to hand over the daughter, um, what you do is beat up the father. 
Uh, I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, and then drag the daughter off by the hair. And then drag the daughter off by the hair, it, it, exactly. Um, but I see, I, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, does anyone else have any thoughts about the game chickens? I, I'll, before I, I would. I thought, yeah, go ahead. There's also the parallel, I think, between toots and chicken with cuddle and Bunsby. I okay. feel like each of those pairings, there's the comic relief that Dickens is giving us, um, but also the, the eccentricity of the pairings that he has fun with, that chicken with toots is, is giving us. That's all I'll say on that. Okay. Over to you. Okay. Um, anyone else have a thought about the game chicken? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you my thought about, about the game chicken. Um, and the parallel that I see is between the Toots chicken pairing and Mr. Dombey and Major Bagstock. And the connection that I see is that the game chicken is really trying to enhance Toots's masculinity. He's trying to teach him how to be a better man and also how to conduct a courtship. And Mr. Dombey, you know, very different from Toots in so many ways, but I think he doesn't know how to conduct a courtship. And that Major Bagstock is his masculinity. I think Dombey, for all of his self-importance and belief in, you know, Dombey and the son, um, is socially inept and does not know how to interact with women. So he needs someone to guide him. He needs someone to take him to Leamington Spa, to introduce him to a beautiful woman, and then to encourage him to make a proposal. Um, and uh, so Toots is in a similar situation. He, he, he wants to court Florence, but he, he's not having much success in that respect. And uh, he hires the game chicken to <laughs> help him become more of a man uh, and to get um, courtship advice ab about it. So it's, it's another version of the, the comic characters doubling the characters in the, in the main plot. But I think it also points out something uh, interesting and important about Mr. Dombey, which is a way in which he is not, well, it's not just that he lacks social skills, but I think his, his masculinity is also in question. And this may yeah. have something to do with the fact that he does not produce a, a, a child through the, the marriage with, with Edith. But yes, yeah, someone had, uh, a, had, a, had a comment. Yeah, I, did. I had a thought on, on the game chicken because yeah. more than a major, the major, he, I kept thinking he's like a metaphor. I, I mean, I couldn't like figure out clearly what it is, but it is, it's just what you said. I thought the metaphor was maybe British gentlemen could use a little, you know, manning up ability, you know, it's like, uh, Dombey is sort of vile, like vile men can be in, in Dickens or anywhere, actually. And, um, but this, you know, Toots, he, he needs to man up. So perhaps Dickens, uh, you know, it's almost metaphorical, like maybe there are a number of those well-educated, well-off men that need to know how to man up, in, in someone's opinion. Um. It could it could be. I think I think you know for for immediate purposes we need to stay within the uh, the confines of this novel and yeah. and look at um, who the examples are of masculinity. And right. as I I was saying last last time at the end of of our uh, our last meeting, I think Bagstock with his name and his grotesque body. Uh, 
is is a kind of walking emblem of a certain kind of vulgar masculinity and with his walking stick and uh, okay. the, the name that suggests male genitals and uh, the, the way that he puffs and swells and um, um, I, I think he's he's a grotesque form of masculinity. Uh, he's a military man um, that sort of also adds to but this. game chicken doesn't even seem like a man to me. <laughs> He didn't win his match with, uh, I, I'm forgetting the name of the, uh, with Larky Ned, wasn't that the name of the, uh, the, the other prize fighter who, who, who beat him in the, in the boxing match. But, but anyway, I mean, I, I use this just as an example of the way to, uh, to, to think about parallel uh, pairings in the novel. And uh, uh, I, I think there are others that we might think of as we, as we move forward. Um, what, what I wanted to do next, and I hope I can do this effectively, is to look at some of the illustrations to the novel and do a kind of quick run through and then focus in on the, um, the illustrations that are for the, the monthly number. So uh, uh, the monthly number, the, the portion. Of, so I need to do share screen. Can people see an illustration? Yes. Yes, okay. So I'm gonna go back to the early parts of the novel and just quickly run through some scenes that will be familiar to you. So this is from the first monthly number and it's, uh, it's an image of Miss Tox in the, in the center, introducing the Toodle family to Mrs. Chick. And um, you remember this scene, uh, uh, there are a couple of things that, that, that I would point out about it. Uh, the, the illustrations are uh, very, they were coordinated between Fizz, uh, Hablo Brown and, and Dickens. So Dickens had, a, had, had a, uh, an important share in um, designing the illustrations or telling Fizz what he wanted to appear. And there are a couple of things in this image that I would point out. One is the obvious contrast between the prolific uh, Toodle family, uh, Polly Toodle, Jemima, uh, her sister, uh, Mr. Toodle, who is, works for the railroad, and uh, the genteel uh, Mrs. Chick and Miss uh, Tots. And uh, so the organization of, of the plate is uh, divided vertically between the genteel and the working class characters. In the background, notice this, this bag, which is covering a chandelier, that will become important uh, in another illustration. And then another thing to point out is the body posture of Miss Tox and this way in which she has her head cocked to the side is an indication, I think, of her deferential posture toward Mrs. Chick. And so that, that head that's cocked to the side instead of being completely vertical is one of the distinctive features of uh, Miss Tox. So here we have that uh, chandelier again. This is uh, uh, the um, Florence arriving in the room, Polly Toodle holding little Paul and meeting her father. Um, it's almost as if meeting her father for the very first time. And this, of, of course, um, Florence on the threshold, uh, just having come in the door, Florence is marginal within this family. So this is the first picture in the novel of Mr. Dombey. And the bag that's covering the chandelier, perhaps because the, uh, uh, I jumped ahead, um, perhaps because the house is in mourning, uh, because, uh, uh, but it hasn't gone into mourning because Paul is still alive. So this is simply a, a way of covering up the, the chandelier um, uh, uh, to prevent it from getting dirty. So um, 
this is the christening scene, and it's uh, it's a comic scene. Uh, Paul's christening over here. There's Paul in uh, Polly Tootle's arms. Susan Nipper up at the left. Mr. Dombey standing tall and stiff in the middle. Uh, uh, Mr. Chick sitting on his hands and whistling um, as he always does. And he's sitting on his hands because it's so cold at the christening. And you remember that Miss Tox over here again with her head slightly askew. And then another detail that um, is uh, prominent in many of the illustrations is the figure up on top of the bookshelf at the upper left. And if you read carefully in the text, you will see that there are references to Pitt. That's uh, the, um, the British prime minister from the 18th century. Uh, and there's a bust of Pitt that appears in many of the illustrations and that looks down on the scene below. And what is it doing there? I think this is a figure for the father. This is the, the Mr. Dombey, the original Mr. Dombey, who has been succeeded by the son whom we now know as Mr. Dombey. So the father or a father figure is observing uh, many of the scenes. This is the scene of, um, that precedes the uh, uh, Mrs. Brown episode early in the novel when Rob the Grinder is being persecuted by the uh, urchins in the street, the boys who make fun of him because he's wearing the uniform of the charitable grinders. And in the background, there is uh, an, an ox or a bull that has escaped and there are people who are trying to keep it under control. And this is what is going to separate Florence from uh, the, uh, from Polly Tootle and from Susan Nipper. Here is Susan uh, just to the right of Polly Tootle uh, holding little Paul. And here is Florence with her, her back to us. So, so Florence is a little bit hard to find in this illustration. Um, this is a wonderful illustration. It shows the difference between the Blimber school, uh, the gentlemen who are in their uniform and the boys who are free to, to play. So it shows the, the, the contrast both in social class and in relative freedom, the, the disciplined uh, sequence of boys. Little Paul hidden over here at the left, not quite in the same uniform as everyone else with a cap instead of a, a hat. Um, and Mr. Blimber with his, uh, his walking stick. Um, this is the farewell scene. Uh, Paul leaving the school to go home for the holidays. And of course, what we know is that um, Paul is going home to die and that in a way, everyone knows that and they're treating Paul with special deference. So, so the, the composition of this is sort of triangular, but everyone is focusing on Paul. And uh, this is Mr. Toots here to the left. Uh, you can tell Mr. Toots because he, uh, he has such a good tailor. He's, he's the best dressed of the young men at the at Blimber's Academy. And Paul has not yet graduated to trousers yet. He's, he's still in, in a kind of skirt. So uh, to, uh, he's, he's not yet uh, a, a full boy. He's still, a f he's still not quite fully gendered. Um, but everyone is focused on Paul and, um, and we are too. This is the another detail. This is the the kindly um, serving girl who's giving sweets to some boys up here. And then at the very top of the triangle, notice the clock. There are also a lot of clocks that appear in the illustrations in this novel. And Paul, you remember, is obsessed with clocks. He's obsessed with 
with time. And time is, a, is an important theme in the novel as a whole. Um, this is Mr. Carker meeting Florence when Florence is visiting the Skettleses. Um, uh, Florence is still protected by a, by a fence, but Carker is in, intruding, uh, in, introducing himself. Uh, the teeth are not quite visible. There's a dog in the background anticipating Diogenes. Um, chasing some, some ducks. So the difference between Carker, who's often associated with cats, and Diogenes, the, the, the dog, uh, is already anticipated in, in this scene. Um, we're moving ahead now to Leamington Spa and the dinner that takes place between the three men, Dombey, Carker, and Joey Bagstock. We have the native. We we uh, we sh should at least pay some uh, attention to the fact that there's a uh, probably a West Indian uh, because Bagstock has has done military service in the West Indies. But I think what's what's most interesting for me about this image is what's missing, and what's missing is. And if you read the scene that accompanies this, is that they're drinking a toast to Edith. And so the three men are sharing Edith. This is a, a scene in which the men are um, toasting, proposing the name of and in recognition to, but they're also sharing a woman. Um, it's they're telling stories about a woman. So it's it's a way, it's a it's a scene of male bonding where the three men share the invisible woman. And if you look up on the wall up here, there's an illustration. Fizz often does this. He'll put a scene in the background, an, an emblem. And this is a a, a representation of a uh, a painting. I, I forget who the painter is of a man meeting a woman who is a procuress. So it's about uh, getting access to sex. It's how, how men deal with sex. So what's happening down here is men are talking about sex. They're talking about, about Edith. And up here is a cruder version of the same thing. And they're about to drink a toast. You can see the, the raised glasses and um, Dombey, uh, seems not quite fully participating in this. It's, you know, most of the energy is shared and the vitality is shared between Carker and Bagstock. Um, this is the introduction of Florence to Edith. Notice the statue up at the top again, um, uh, Pitt, uh, as he is named. Um, and this is Mr. Dombey again, stiff, always rigid, uh, never any flexibility or suppleness in his uh, physical representation. Um, Edith, uh, haughty, I think her raised head is, um, is a, an indication not of servility or of deference, but of her pride. And one of the things that Mr. Dombey is drawn to in Edith is that she reflects his own sense of pride. And their heads are almost exactly parallel. This, of course, is Mrs. Skewton in her, um, her chair, Cleopatra, as she's called, and uh, Diogenes down here with Florence. Notice how much Florence has grown. Florence is now becoming a woman. Uh, the house is undergoing what the novel calls alterations. Um, it's being redecorated in preparation for the arrival of the new Mrs. Dombey. And over here, you have a curtain that's covering a portrait. And that's a portrait of the first Mrs. Dombey who is now being obscured and will sort of disappear as the new trophy wife uh, uh, moves into the picture. Um, this is the uh, the illustration of the of the wedding of the of the marriage. It's the return home after the wedding, 
And one of the things to point out about this illustration is that it's in what we have learned to call landscape uh, display. That is, it's a horizontal display rather than vertical. And all of the, the images that we've looked at up to this point are vertical in their orientation. This one is horizontal, which gives it greater emphasis. And one of the things that um, the illustration is doing is uh, asking us to find who's there. So if we start identifying the characters, uh, this is Mr. Dombey, stiff as usual. This is Edith uh, entering the door. Notice the little clock up here. Um, notice the classical statue again of sort of version, not quite pit, because the pit figure appears in, um, in Mr. Dombey's house. Um, uh, what else do we see? This is Joey Bagstock accompanying a figure who looks like a very young uh, figure, judging by the narrow waist and the fancy clothes. But of course, this is Cleopatra. This is Mrs. Uh, behind them is Cousin Phoenix, uh, the aristocratic of the Granger family, uh, the Scutin relative uh, who adds a dimension of social class. Then behind Cousin Phoenix is Florence emerging from the carriage and being handed down by Carker. So Carker here is handing, and the, the word is, is important because wh whenever Carker touches uh, someone, touches particularly women, uh, there's always a little erotic tingle. Um, around the wedding party are bell ringers um, and uh, over to the right, uh, a musical band with drums and musical instruments. Uh, in the farther is a Punch and Judy show, which uh, if you know anything about Punch and Judy, that's one of the standard plots is that Punch beats up on Judy. Um, so it's uh, a portent of uh, unhappy marriage. And then in the far distant background over to the right is a funeral carriage. Uh, you, you can tell that because of the hats that the uh, drivers are, are wearing. So death is present in this scene of, of marriage. But there are two other figures uh, whom I hope you have recognized. One is Miss Tox. Miss Tox is here to be a witness, not to be an official witness, but to, uh, to see the marriage of Mr. Dombey for whom she had romantic hopes. And so she's there, her, her head again in that slightly cocked version. And then down below Miss Tox is good Mrs. Brown, who's also there. So there are lots of little things that are hidden in the illustrations. This is, you know, a, an important scene in the novel, the, the wedding. Um, I even think that there are um, servants, this, this, the figure with the tall uh, top hat here at the entrance um, and the two at the far left who are smirking because they all know that Mr. Dombey has, uh, has obtained a trophy wife and they're, they're not uh, deceived about what's really going on. Marriage is a business. That's why the band is here. That's why the bell ringers are here. Everybody's out to make a penny. Um, this is a, a scene with uh, the other Carker brother, John Carker and his sister Harriet, uh, Alice Marwood and good Mrs. Brown taking the, the money uh, back, refusing to accept the money. That's a, a subplot we should probably say something about. This is one of my favorite illustrations in the novel. And it's the first uh, reception and dinner party that is hosted by Mr. Dombey after the marriage. And the comedy of this, again, notice it's in the horizontal display, the horizontal format, um, and th that gives it a particular emphasis. And the comedy of this is that Mr. Dombey has invited all of his friends, 
who are from the merchant class or the banking class. And Edith has invited people who are from her social class. And there's a cleavage that goes diagonally down across and divides one group from the other. And you can tell the difference uh, between the two groups by the clothes that they are wearing and the posture that they have. So start with the aristocratic uh, uh, genteel people. And notice how legs of gentlemen are represented with the tight uh, clothing uh, and the small feet. Um, this is cousin Phoenix over, over at the far left. On, on the, the extreme left are Cleopatra and Joey Bagstock. And then next to them is cousin Phoenix. And the aristocrats, the upper class, the, the gentry, are looking down their noses at these specimens of the middle class who are arriving. So the, the gentleman, the tallest in this sort of pyramid group over on the left-hand side is looking through glasses and looking down his nose at the men on the other side. And notice the ungenteel posture, of particularly this man who's sitting with his back to us in the exact center. Um, he's sitting with his legs apart. Um, as opposed to the gentlemen who are all sitting with their legs crossed. And he has, uh, the trouser legs are wide. They're not the fashionable ones. Mr. Dombey is a little bit more fashionable than the others, but the um, rather portly gentleman who's entering um, has wider legs and a less elegant posture. Uh, and all the people on the right-hand side are of the middle class, the merchant class. Um, and uh, the two, there are two other, well, there are two, two other figures on the right-hand side we need to recognize. One is Mr. Chick and the other is Mrs. Chick, who uh, are uncomfortable because they realize that they were not really meant to be at this party um, and that they were invited only because Mrs. Chick insisted that they be invited. So uh, they're feeling bored and annoyed because they don't have anyone there to talk to and they're feeling out of sorts. Um, and then back over on the left-hand side, we have a sort of smaller pyramid inside the larger pyramid. And at the center of that is, is Edith. Um, her shoulders are bare. Um, that's something that is frequently commented on. She's surrounded by the genteel men uh, there's Florence at the far left. Florence, Florence will, in the illustrations, will keep growing up as he uh, gets older. And then there's Carker, because Carker is present at the party. And Carker is standing, as you might expect, directly above Edith. So Carker is the only member of the well, what class does Carker belong to? That's a good question about the novel. But Carker is the only one of what we might call the business group, um, uh, the men from Mr. Dombey's world, who is able to mingle with the gentry. And so we see him over here uh, with the group of the uh, genteel people. And uh, of course, he's hovering directly above Edith because uh, he's, um, he always has his eyes on her. Mr. Dombey, stiff again, as usual, on the right-hand side. So it's a, it's a wonderful illustration that uh, shows the, the difference in social class through gesture, uh, body posture, and, and clothing. Um, uh, this is the illustration of the two pairs of mother daughters. Um, it happens to be colorized for some reason that I, I, I'm not uh, completely sure about. It was black and white in the original, but on the right are good Mrs. Brown and Alice Marwood, her daughter. On the left are Cleopatra and Edith. And um, they're 
symmetrical. The composition is symmetrical. Uh, it, uh, good Mrs. Brown and Cleopatra uh, facing each other. Uh, Cleopatra held by her page. Do you remember the name of the page? Uh, he pushes her, uh, her bath cart. Her, um, her, his name is Withers, wonderful name. Um, and then the two daughters whom we see in parallel posture uh, facing each other. And the most interesting thing about the portrayal of Alice is the position of her hands. And you may remember that she's carrying, I don't think it's rabbit skins. That's what Mrs. Uh, good Mrs. Brown carries to sell, but she's carrying some kind of knitted goods that she sells. Um, so that's what she's carrying here. They're, they're beggars. They're out on the uh, on on the the heath or on the on the hills, um, begging, and Cleopatra is actually giving money to good Mrs. Brown. Um, but what's interesting is the body posture. Uh, Edith is completely covered by bonnet and cloak. Um, uh, we see her hair, and hair is is always interesting in. Uh, visual portraits of, uh, of women, because if you have your hair up, you're a proper woman. If you have your hair down, uh, you're, you're sexier, and maybe you're a little loose. And so the bonnet contains Edith's hair, but Alice has no bonnet, and her hair is, uh, is loose and flowing around her shoulders. But her hands, her cloak is open and it exposes her hands. And her hands are together in front of her body. Um, you, you might even say they're in front of her genitals. Um, and they're in a posture that suggests that she has some kind of handcuffs on or some kind of chain that uh, binds her hands together. And this is reminiscent of the fact that she has been transported. She was, um, uh, this is part of the backstory for Alice that she was a prostitute and prostitute, as a prostitute convicted was transported to Australia and has recently returned. But she was literally a prisoner. And um, the reference to manacles or, or handcuffs in the, uh, the position of her hands is a reference to the um, way in which Edith is also manacled uh, or um, in, a, in a position that suggests that she is also a prisoner or to use another metaphor that the novel uh, makes use of is a slave. So these are the chains that bind a slave. Uh, women in the patriarchal society are, are slaves. Um, so this is a uh, uh, an example of the uh, the doubling. Um, Carker uh, and Dombey, Carker with his portrait of the uh, woman who resembles Edith, um, the bird that is a prisoner, uh, the cat that is waiting to pounce. Carker is uh, associated with cats. Dombey oblivious to the plot that Carker is hatching. Um, now we're getting to where we are in the story. This is Susan Nipper about to leave uh, after she has told off Mr. Dombey. Uh, Mrs. Pipchin, who is now who has now replaced uh, another substitution, is that Dombey has uh, taken away from Edith the right to be the mistress of the house, to be in, in charge of domestic management and has placed Mrs. Pipchin his, uh, in, in charge of the household. And so it's another insult to, to, to eat it. At the center, Florence bidding farewell to, uh, to Susan, Diogenes um, on, on the, the margins. And then this is, uh, I think the last image in the section that we've read is Lawrence um, meeting Edith on the staircase, which is always a reminder of 
the scenes, the staircase seasons, uh, see, scenes in the novel that go back to the time when Dombey saw uh, uh, Florence and uh, little Paul going up the staircase together. And the staircase is uh, a region of, of, of bonding uh, between people that excludes Mr. Dombey. And Mr. Dombey is, uh, is apparent here in the lavish furnishings of the house, the statue, the, you know, th this is Mr. Dombey's taste in, in women. Um, over here is uh, a statue that has a classical uh, content. This is Agamemnon sacrificing Iphigenia uh, from the Odyssey, uh, the theme of daughter sacrifice that anticipates what will happen with, um, with, uh, with Florence. So um, that's the end of the little slideshow that I prepared. And I just you know, hope you will pay attention to, I, I, I did a lot of illustrations because I, I got um, um, interested in, in, in looking at these scenes and trying to figure out how to relate them to some of the themes that we have been talking about. But um, I'm going to stop and go back and invite you to talk about what interests you in the section of the novel that we have read for today. Um, I'll just remind you that it's the section that goes from the wedding, we saw the illustration of that, uh, to the um, departure of Edith and Florence. And it's the part of the story that I've called the marriage uh, section. It's, it's really, there's not a lot of action, of dramatic action that takes place in this uh, until the Thunderbolt chapter at the end when uh, uh, Edith leaves and Florence tries to intervene and Dombey strikes her. Uh, the only other major event that happens in this section of the novel is the death of Cleopatra, the death of, of Mrs. Skewton, which is a, a wonderful part of, of, of the novel. But the rest of this plot, the rest of this section of the novel is really about the, um, the four people, uh, who make up the central emotional configuration in the novel. Uh, and they are Dombey, Edith, Carker, and Florence. So that's really what I would like to have you talk about if you um, would care to comment on any aspect of the um, emotional dynamics. And um, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about what Carker's strategy is. Carker, Carker, we need to pay more attention to Carker. So let me invite you to, to speak. Yes, I, I see Peggy's hand up. So. Oh, Phyllis, start with Phyllis. I'll, I'll count on Courtney to, to handle. Oh. Okay, I, I actually took my hand down because I was going in another direction from what you were, but if I may, um, the, the chapter where uh, Cleopatra dies, Yes. Uh, is um, is a wonderful. Uh, uh, he must have had an intimate knowledge of debilitating illness. I mean, it's it's almost it's so well done. But but it also um, points out a rhetorical uh, method that he has that is another form of doubling. Um, the chapter begins, all is going on as it was wont. The waves or horse with repetition of their mystery, the dust lies piled upon the shore, so on and so forth. And at the end, after she's dead, but all goes on as it was wont upon the margin of the unknown sea and so on. Um, so that was a circular thing. And I picked up, um, and maybe this is common in Dickens. I just was picking it up more and more in this section of the book we were reading of he will have passages where he repeats a phrase very close together. Um, and uh, it, it 
I don't have them to hand, but I can think of maybe half a dozen times when it just starts to happen. So to me, that seemed like another kind of a rhetorical doubling um, that he's doing, um, circling back and bringing you forward, circling back, bringing you forward. So that was, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that, that's all. Yeah, um, an another thing to point out, and even the two little snippets that you read um, are examples of this, is that this entire chapter is in the present tense. Um, so uh, he, 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 there are uh, at, at least two chapters that I can think of, this one and the one about the wedding, that are written in the present tense. And it's, the, it, it's a present tense that is used to depict events that happened in the past. But by putting it in the tense that is called the historical present, it gives it more vividness, it brings it forward to the reader to experience. And it also has a kind of timelessness that I think is related to what you just pointed out, which is the repetition, the circularity. Um, it calls attention to a certain temporal quality that is at once timeless because it's repetition. And I think it's related to um, sort of a cosmic time that is in the background of this novel that is what the waves are always saying, that the, the waves are eternal. The, the way, what, what Paul hears in the voice of the waves is the voice of eternity. It's the voice of, of where his mother is. Uh, it's, it's a voice that exists outside of, of time. And so these chapters that are written in the present tense and that have this kind of suspension of, of time, suspension of time is done in other ways in, in, in the novel, I think um, is, is related to that larger theme of time, you know, the inevitable march of time, and then the eternity that lies behind it somewhere. And it's evident in repetition. And, and the one character to escape the march of time is little Paul in a way. I mean, he never leaves what he started as. Yeah. He dies as he was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the, 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 uh, just to comment about one other thing, which is uh, the wonderful way in which uh, Cleopatra uh, has, um, um, you know, first, uh, what, what, what is, what's the term, a TIA? She has a temporary sort of pre-stroke pre um, and that's manifest in the difficulties that she has with language and she can't remember certain words. The, uh, and her and, bonnet bobs. And her bonnet the palsy. bobs, <laughs> her palsy, uh, which the narrator says is, uh, describes with great irony, of course, as the breeze that is blowing through uh, uh, the place where she sits because Cleo Cleopatra uh, always is praising nature and the, the value of being at one with nature. And nothing could be more artificial than Cleopatra who is, there's, there's no person there because it's all assembled by her maid who takes her apart at night when she goes to bed and then reassembles her in the morning. I mean, uh, Cleopatra is a wonderful minor. So she, she, she's another zombie. <laughs> she's another zombie, um, e exactly. And um, she's, she's pushed by uh, this, the servant Withers, which is a, another play on words because it's both the rear end of a horse and the inevitable end to which she is moving. One of the great minor characters in all of Dickens is, is uh, Mrs. Skeeton. So what, el what else interests you? It's, it's, it's your turn, folks, to... I think Peggy had a hand up, but Courtney, help me. With... Um, you, would, well, you would ask about Carker, and I was yeah. going to respond to that, but we sort of went somewhere else. Carker is after both Edith and Florence in some sense. And um, I think Carker's whole thing is to do in Dombey, who he hates, basically, and is jealous of and 
part of this may go into the next section, so I didn't want to go too far, but that's Carker's motive is to just take down Dombey. He can steal his wife, he can steal his daughter, and that's where I went with it, except that every time he's mentioned, I want to go take a bath. <laughs> Okay. Other comments about Carker and Carker's motive and Carker's strategy. Uh, Kevin? I think Peggy, Peggy has given us a good start. Courtney? Oh, on Carker, this? yeah. Um, you know, it seems like he pivots a little bit from Floy to Edith. Bernie Madoff died this week another conscientious manager of other people's money. And I kind of, you know, and then the, the obituary and the economist that said, you know, this thing went on for years and years and years. And it, it seems like Carker strategically is playing the long game. He's definitely after Dombey, but he's adapting strategically, you know, to what, what's coming along the way. So, I, I mean, I love that line when he says, time was, it was well to watch even your rising little star talking of Floyd and know in what quarter there were clouds to shadow you if needful, but a planet has arisen and you are lost in its light. So it gets back to that kind of cosmic thing that you were saying, but I, I'd like to pivot a little bit to the Thunderbolt chapter, John, and ask you, what do you think of this uh, sort of uh, metaphysical rant that Dickens goes on and talking about taking the roofs off of houses and he evokes sort of the the spirit of, uh, of ignorance and despair from a Christmas carol with these gaunt children and so on. D do you think that was part of the, the scheme from inception uh, in, this, in, in planning this novel? Or do you think maybe that arose along the way? Um, it's a good question. And uh, it's a passage that many people have puzzled over. And you're right to sort of single it out because it doesn't seem quite to fit in in, in the novel because it's uh, it, it's it's as you say a kind of metaphysical um, uh, digression. Uh, it, it it seems to be an observation about the state of society and, and about the um, in some ways an observation about the role of the novelist. Uh, whose job it is to lift the rooftops off and to expose what's underneath. So to examine um, you know, the interiors of society. And that would be both the Dombey household and what's going on in the main plot of this novel. But it, it goes much beyond that because it really talks about, um, it addresses the question of what is natural. And, and it begins by saying things that are identified by many people as natural and unnatural um, are misnamed. That the un, what is, that poor people and um, the, the lower classes in general and uh, the poverty and crime and uh, uh, things that are associated with with, uh, with poverty and disease and crime, that that's unnatural. But Dickens argues that it is natural and it's natural because it has been created by the rest of society. So it's an indictment of the existing social order as being responsible for the things that the existing social order does not want to recognize as their responsibility. Um, so it comes out of nowhere for me. Uh, it, it, it really doesn't seem uh, to fit with the story that we're reading about. Uh, it, it seems like uh, Dickens editorializing about larger issues that are on his mind that he wants to insert into this story. And um, that's, that's about what I uh, have to say about it at this point. Um, and I'd be interested to, to know what other people think. It, it, it really, you know, you're, you're perfectly correct to ask about what it's doing there. 
um, you know, how it fits. But, but I do think, I mean, I, I, I am interested in Carker and I hope we'll get back to Carker, but uh, who's, who's next, Courtney? So, Clara? Ah, well, of course, Carker is, is interesting, but I, what I wanted to talk about this time rereading, I was just struck by Dickens, uh, what should I say, uh, the abundance of imagination that he uses in creating particular speech patterns. In this section with Bunsby and Captain Cuddle and Mr. Toots and with Carker, what sets him apart is that terrible smile. Uh, but I just, I don't know that I've, I mean, I've shared before that I fell in love with mm. Pickett's papers in part because of Mr. Jingle. And then I love, I love Sari Gamp's, like I call them arias. Mm -hmm. I just think it's, you know, as many times as I've read and reread the novels, you can be struck anew by something like this, that, you know, <laughs> Bunsby is just hilarious. That Mr. C Gavin Cuddle thinks he's, you know, a genius. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, well, it's just wonderful, this section for that. Can, can, can you say more about what it is about Bunsby's language that you find so interesting? Well, it's very, it's very, um, <laughs> oracular and very, I mean, he, he says almost nothing. He says and, nothing. He's, and, he's an oracle. He's supposed to be a prophet who tells yeah. the future. Yeah, but Captain Cuddle just waits for his, his verdict because that's going to be the, the words of wisdom. And uh, yeah, I mean, just the, the I, I always think of the word fecundity where it comes to Dickens, the fecundity of, of language and rhetorical strategies that make it possible to give so much life to such an abundance of characters. And uh, these speech patterns are just marvelous. Do you want to say anything about Carker's language? Oh, well, it's, it's oleogenous. You know, I mean, he's, he tells, he tells, uh, Dombey what Dombey wants to hear and lays it on with a trowel and um, and gives, you know, he's he snarls when it's, I mean, the way he's he toys with Cap and Cuddle that he's reasonably nice to at first and then just snarls at when it suits his fancy. So um, he's, he's two-faced and multi-languaged, um, you know, depending on what his self-interest is and how he yeah. can play a particular person that he's interacting with. Okay, I'll, I'll comment just briefly on that. Carker is the rhetorical genius of this novel because he can adapt his language to the situation that however he wants. And if you, if you compare Carker's language with Dombey's language. Dombey's language is stiff, just the way that, that uh, his body is stiff. And he talks in contract language. For him, marriage is a contract. And he governs everything by business terms. And Carker is so much farther beyond that. Carker, it's, it, it's one of the reasons that Carker can Cross the boundary between the gentry and the middle class or the business people, because Carker can adapt himself to whatever situation he is in. So uh, it's it, it's it's hard to talk about this without just sort of finding specific examples. But but you're right, the oleaginous um, um, uh, quality of Carker's language is what distinguishes him. Other other questions though. Courtney. And Gary. Yes. Um, to add to what you just said, <clears throat> John, about Carker, what I find so interesting about this segment is, of course, when we see him, he's always riding a horse and he's really adept at that. However, look who falls off the horse. 
yeah. Mr. Dombey. So it's kind of, in a sense, symbolic, arguably, of how Carker can navigate anything as it relates to what you're saying, whether it's with language or sexual um, flirting or what have you. And Dombey doesn't know how to do that. And he yeah. fall, he ends up falling off. Yeah, yeah. Which, which I think is, is so interesting to think about. I mean, I, I absolutely love the um, the development of character in this section. I mean, I see it that way. There's a psychology behind, of course, um, Florence and what she's experiencing, no doubt, in the midst of these, of her father and Edith, who she sees as a mother, you know, as a mother. And, and Edith herself, I think, is a, just a fascinating character to watch. And of course, her losing her mother and all of that, all of that happening among these these four characters that you mentioned earlier. Finally, the only other thing I wanted to mention was um, in the Thunderbolt chapter, um, what I'm fascinated here as always in, in a novel is the narrator. And the narrator in that Thunderbolt chapter, and it was alluded to earlier when, when there's that reference to time, time as a theme and early on in the chapter, time consoler of affliction and a softener of anger. That's what mm -hmm. starts out in that chapter. And of course we know what happens as a result. <laughs> and then that, that line that's the second paragraph of the Thunderbolt chapter, let us be just to him, referring to Mr. Dombey. And I'm thinking, oh my God, with what happens here. And I look back at that, I think to myself, how can we be just to him at this point? So mm -hmm. those are my comments. Okay, all, all very astute and thank you. Uh, Phyllis? Did, was that me? Yes. Um, I, I've looked up Carker in the OED and uh, it's an archaic word, but it's pretty interesting. Uh, it is to load or to burden, to impose a charge upon, to burden with care, uh, burden as care does, worry, harass, vex, trouble. So um, that's actually to cark. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought that was uh, kind of interesting. Um, and uh, in terms of the um, another power that Carker has, and I, I was looking for the passage in it, but Edith is brooding over him that she, he can read her. He, he knows everything about her. And then Rob the Grinder is cast in his spell. Even when he's not near him, he's afraid to even think about him because he has this power to read him. And obviously he has the power to read Dombey because he, he'll change in mid-sentence, he'll change to adjust to the um, currents of the conversation. So Carker has a lot of um, power. Um, uh, but he's creepy. Ugh, like <laughs> no doubt about that. Yes. Um, uh, and his, his power exceeds normal powers. Um, I mean, he, 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 there's something slightly demonic or Luciferian about him. Uh, and uh, his, his ability to see, to read what's going on in situations and he that, of course that goes back to those teeth too um, it goes back to the teeth it goes back the to disembodied his, yeah. his animal magnetism that he's able to to just through the power of his presence including that horse that he that he rides so skillfully i mean you know he's 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 a, a deft manager of animals um as as well and of rob the grinder uh, so, and it, his power extends to his language in, in situations, the, the, in the situations where he is in conversation with both Dombey and Edith, he's able to speak in ways that defer to Dombey and communicate a completely different meaning to Edith. And Dombey and is Dombey. oblivious. And Dombey even sets him up to be the go-between. Yeah. 
And then Edith says, I'm not going to listen to anything you tell me from him. And he says, she is not to respond to me. Yeah. So Carker is in complete control of the relationship and the conversation, literally. You know? we, could, we could even say it's a bad modern pun that he's the mouthpiece for Dombey. David? It's, oh, Dickens goes as far as he could go in terms of the standards of the period in making it pretty clear that Carker has a live-in mistress. And it occurs to me that Carker is maybe the only character in the novel who has a sex life. We know about his past and he's actively scheming sexually <coughs> at this point where everyone else is want to be in one way or another. If Dickens were to return to us and were prepared to write a bit more, what I would like him to write that he carefully omitted, leaving uh, an ent uh, entire serial number without Dombey and Edith, I'd love to know how he would portray their honeymoon. <laughs> Um, one of the things that David is, is talking about is that, uh, well, the, do Dombey and Edith ever have sex? Um, and I think an argument can be made that the reason that uh, no child is born from that marriage is that Edith refuses to have sex with, with uh, her husband. Um, and uh, the honeymoon would be an interesting episode to have described because that would be the point of sexual uh, interaction between husband and wife. And if you go back and, and look at the monthly number that follows the wedding, when they have gone off to Paris, romantic Paris, right? That's the sexy place to go on a, on a honeymoon. Um, there are, in, the, in the monthly number that follows, Dombey and Edith are absent. They're absent because they're, well, they're in Paris and the story has stayed in England. And there are three chapters in that, um, uh, in that monthly number. So how long, we could begin by saying, how long is the Dombey honeymoon? It lasts for a month. Uh, so the story time and the narrative time uh, coincide at this point. Um, and if you read those three chapters, they, they deal with different characters in different situations, but they all have one thing in common, and that's the weather. And there is a, a notable electrical storm that takes place in each of those three chapters. And I think that's our clue to what's happening in Paris, is that there's a storm that is happening in the relationship between the newly married Mr. Dombey and, and Edith. And um, we cannot say with certainty because it's not narrated whether they ever have sexual intercourse or not. But we do know that there's no child born of that union. We do know that um, Edith has a separate apartment inside the Dombey house. It's, uh, it's, it's very interesting to try and reconstruct the disposition mm -hmm. of rooms in that house. Mr. Dombey has his own rooms on the ground floor of the, of the building. Um, and he retreats there often, almost like a prisoner. I mean, Dombey, Dombey seems imprisoned inside his own magnificent house. Um, but uh, 
Carker, on the other hand, is very sensual. Uh, we can tell, you know, he's not the cold, he's not the frigid, uh, stiff, al almost deadly stiff uh, figure that Dombey is. Dombey is, uh, is the frozen gentleman he's described at one point. Um, he has no sensuality, he has no sense of play, no sense of suaveness or um, uh, no ability to interact with the opposite sex. And Carker is feline in that respect. Um, he's sensuous and we visit his home and we see how luxuriously, not, not ostentatiously cold the way that Dombey is, but it, it exhibits exquisite taste. Um, and it, for me, raises the question of what social class Carker belongs to. And Carker, in one sense, is, you know, he's, a, um, he, he's upper management, I guess we would say, if we used corporate terminology from, from today. But he's an employee. He's, he's staff. He's not, um, he's, he's not on the board of directors. He's not a Dombey. Um, but he's upwardly mobile and aspires to replace Dombey. Um, uh, from the very beginning of the novel, one of the things that Carker does is to study Dombey. And he sees the posture that Dombey selects, which is to stand with his hands behind him in front of the fire. So Carker goes and stands with his hands behind him in front of the fire. He's imitating Dombey. Um, and he sees, he's already in charge of the, the business. I mean, Dombey has no idea about how to run the business. Um, Carker has already replaced him as the manager of, of the business. Um, uh, then Paul dies. So Carker says, ah, there's an empty slot in the sun position. Maybe I can move into that. Uh, that's a way to inherit the firm. Um, marry the daughter. So Florence is the first target of his uh, sexual interest. And Florence is, feels that he's creepy. I mean, he's, he, when, when we say he's creepy, one of the things we mean, I think, is that he's got a, an erotic energy that circulates around him and that uh, women in particular respond to. And I think Edith recognizes that. So, uh, you know, he shifts his attention. He becomes more ambitious. It's Edith, not Florence. Why, why waste your time on the little girl uh, when you can have the wife? So all of this is, is as, um, as Peggy said, it's, it's designed to both destroy, but also to replace Dombey. And the grandest and, you know, the point where he perhaps overreaches is in uh, tackling Edith, because Edith may be a match for him. Um, oh, yeah, I have Edith. Oh, um, uh, Carolyn, Carolyn Nist. And I have a question. Well, of, of course, you know, Carker is malevolent and horrible, and you, you can tell from the minute you meet his teeth that yeah. he's, got something not good planned. But I thought it was interesting that in the chapter, recognizant and reflective, that he finally is able to uh, say out loud what his plans are to his brother, John Carker, where he says, um, I tell you that your hypocrisy, talking to his brother, and meekness, that all hypocrisy and meekness of this place is not worth that to me, snapping his finger and thumb. I see through it as if it was air. There's not a man employed here standing between myself and the lowest place who wouldn't be glad in his heart to see his master humbled, who does not hate him secretly, who does not wish him evil rather than good, and so on. <laughs> I thought that was him finally coming out. And I thought it was interesting that it was to his brother, his long suffering brother. Mm -hmm. Which we don't know why he's um, suffering at, to this point. Um, we we do have some 
information about that early in the novel that he stole money from the the mm -hmm. firm and the Dombey father um, forgave him and allowed him to remain in the firm, but as an example to other people, both of the um, um, the fact that if you commit a crime against the firm that you will be discovered and also that uh, the the father Mr. Dombey Sr. has the power to forgive and therefore to keep under surveillance so that John Carker will forever be indebted to the father so it's a it's a complex um, game that is being acted out but I think you're right to point to that passage because it it gets at another dimension of Carker's motivation, which is not just envy, it's not, it's, it, it is, it's certainly it's power. Uh, he, he's power hungry, he's ambitious in all sorts of ways. But uh, when he associates his hatred of Dombey with the hatred that everyone in the firm feels toward Dombey, he's claiming a kind of class solidarity that this is really about the, the uh, resentment that people of the lower classes feel toward people like Dombey. And um, this is one of the things that he will use as a lever to get, to work his way closer to Edith. Because Edith, I mean, they're, they're very different in their backgrounds. Why, you know, what, what, why we need to think about and talk about why Edith, what Edith's feelings about Carker are. Um, we, we've already said that Carker can read her. Um, and Carker touches her at many points. And uh, when he talks in front of her, uh, her um, color comes to her cheek, to her bosom. Uh, uh, she, she has a kinesthetic, a physical, a visceral response to Carker, which is very complex. Um, and I think it's both attraction to a man who has something in common with her which is their position as subordinates uh, in, in the presence of someone who is uh, their enslaver. They are both slaves to, to Dombey. Um, and um, they're also kindred spirits in some, in some way. So anyway, we need to talk more about that. Uh, who's, who's next? I wanna make sure people- right. Okay, so we have a, a little bit of a cue. Um, so I'll, I'll help uh, remind people, but uh, next up is Kathy, then Alan, then Peggy, then Cindy. So, uh, Kathy. I was um, struck by Dickens' use of nature in this novel. Um, the storm, you mentioned the, the electrical storms when the, when the honeymoon is occurring, the sea, and Mrs. Skewton's total <laughs> misidentification with nature. Yes. <laughs> She's probably the most artificial person in the whole novel, but there is, there's both a remove and an intimacy in these natural images. And I think and we see this in the character of Carker because he is um, sort of the primal instinct personified and I think that's one reason why the female characters find him both attractive in a not um, pleasant way and also a threat. There's a wonderful passage when um, he, they're talking about, the narrator is talking about him watching Edith and he says, um, Florence, or not Edith, but Florence, Florence tossed on an uneasy sea of doubt and hope and Mr. Carker, like a scaly monster of the deep, swam down below and kept his shining eye upon her. That's almost as good an image as the teeth, I think. <laughs> and then in the scene where um, yeah, Dombey yeah. decides to enlist um, Carker as the emissary 
the go-between with between himself and Edith, um, the narrator says, he continued, why did you tell her? You see, he continued with a smile and softly laying his velvet hand as a cat might have laid its sheath claws on Mr. Dombey's arm. So we get that feline reference. And I thought also, you mentioned the horse earlier. Of course, a man riding a horse is a sexual symbol and he masters this horse. And yet the horse is a white horse, which typically is a symbol of virtue. So we have this, this man who is anything but virtuous mastering the symbol of virtue. So all of those things I thought were interesting to me. All of those points are, are excellent. And I think you're right in identifying Carker with the natural world in a way that almost no one else. I mean, Paul, you could say Paul and the and the the waves, but those waves aren't really the, you know, he doesn't want to go swimming. Um, mm -hmm. That's the waves of eternity. <laughs> that's the eternal um, realm. Um, the only thing I would uh, disagree just slightly about is that the horse is a symbol of virtue because it's not a white horse, it's a white stockinged horse. It's, it's a uh. horse that has white legs, but it's not a white horse. So, um, oh. Uh, that's just a small detail, but, um, but thank you. One. Those are all good points. Alan? Thanks. So Dickens shows Clarker as a player, right? That he's a master of games. And it's interesting, it's ironic that Dombey knows that Clarker is fantastic at all games, that not just his aesthetic knowledge with paintings and things, but that all games, Dombey knows Clarker is fantastic at this. And yet Dombey doesn't know that he's being played by Clarker or he doesn't appear to thus far in this novel know that he's being played so much by Clarker. One of the, one of my favorite bits of describing Clarker as a master of games is his ability. He's learned the tricks of being able to win a chess game without looking at the board. <laughs> and then there's later we see when Dombey visits Clarker's house and he's sitting underneath the portrait of Edith. There's this wonderful dialogue going on where again, like those pictures you were showing us earlier, John, where people are toasting Edith and she's, she's present and she's being attacked or being um, felt in, in a way um, that here she's not actually in the room, but her portrait is and Dickens cleverly weaves the two so that Clarker's talking to Dombey, but also talking to her, ha ha, gloating about how he's watching Dombey's reaction and able to manipulate and play him. It's of no consequence, yes. as Toots would say. All of, <laughs> not of no consequence. It's, it's, all of those are, are excellent points. Um, just one thing I, I would s rephrase slightly is that Dombey does know that Carker is adept at every game, but he can't possibly conceive that he would be an object in a game that Carker would play because he is Dombey. He's, he's so stuck on himself that he can't imagine that anyone else would be playing him. Um, so, because Carker is his manager, or his, he, he possesses, there, there's a, a, a large, there are a number of places where in conversations between Edith and Carker, where the word possession or the verb to possess is used to indicate Dombey's um, treatment of Carker, that Dombey thinks he possesses uh, Carker. 
and possesses Edith. Um, so, but anyway, thank you. Good points. Peggy? A couple of things. Back to the wedding and the wedding night. And the one thing about just to start with, with Carker and Edith, there's a phrase I heard a while ago that from another woman that what appeals to one end of me appalls the other. I think that's what's going on with Edith. But the wedding night thing, Edith has been trained to do everything, you know, to catch somebody. She paints, she sings, she plays the piano. So she was trained to be the wife on a wedding night and she just lay there. And I think after a while that probably inhibited Dombey himself, but all she has to do to, uh, to do this, she didn't have to shop for the wedding or anything. She just has to lay there. Um, so that's what I thought about it. Unfortunately, we'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> we can sure we, will. we can make it up any way we want. <laughs> we can make it up any way we want. Um, but uh, um, I, I mean, given the the way in which their relationship develops, I can't, I can't imagine the two of them being intimate. That's right. You know? Well, he's just trying to make a baby, and she's just lying there, checking it off of her to do list to be a wife thing that. Even though she what's her what's her birth control method? <laughs> Still, you know, after a while, that might. I mean, after a while, her attitude got to him. I want you to change your attitude, and that's the only way I can imagine it. Um, yeah. I don't know. Okay, Cindy. Okay, the, uh, this is somewhat trivial because I'm not sure if it's true, which is. I wonder, John, if you think that um, Carker's teeth are also doubled or tripled in, in the novel. I mean, there's the one time when he comments on Diogenes' teeth when he snaps at the uh, toots. And then the dog, of course, really barks at Carker. Meaning, I know, I think you've said that Dickens liked dogs. And, oh, obviously, here's my dog. I like dogs. And uh, many of us think that dogs can recognize character and therefore the lack of character in uh, Carter, because he sure did bark at him. So, uh, and then the dog has teeth, the Carker has teeth, and I think there's other doubling in the book about um, Carker's teeth. And to the extent it is a, a, a sample of power, I think it's another thing of power in, uh, besides creepiness, of course, creepiness at the foreground, but it's also <laughs> power because teeth can hurt you. Um, I, I suppose we could say there's good teeth and bad teeth in the novel that, uh, you know, <laughs> there's Diogenes teeth, but um, another way of thinking about Carker is that those may be artificial teeth, that they, uh, and I don't mean that in a literal sense, I don't, I don't mean that he's got dentures. Um, that they're a form of prosthesis that uh, substitute for normal teeth and it give additional power because they are um, sort of superhuman. And, and this is a novel that has other prostheses, uh, Captain Cuddle, you know, and Captain Cuddle's, one way to read Captain Cuddle's hook is you you could say okay castration there's you know he's he's a kind of simple fool he's part of this you know lack of masculinity that we see in in toots but captain cuddle's hook is remarkably adept and there are times when the hook does things that a normal hand might not be able to achieve <laughs> And, and wasn't it gender at some point? Hasn't he used it in a gender fashion? In his, what? I, I'm in sorry, a tender I, way. Yeah, thought, oh yes, he uses it in a tender way. I mean, right. uh, there, there, there's, a, there's one place where he places his cold hook on someone's warm hand. Yeah, and, it's the opposite uh, of threatening and a hook is usually threatening, but yes, not- Yes, exactly, exactly. I mean, Cap Captain, Captain Cuddle's 
you know, and there's a play on his name as as well. I mean, cut yeah. his, his hand has been cut off. And I think but, there's maybe his, teeth doubling his, later in the fourth section. I think there might be more teeth doubling with Parker. Yeah. So to to think of the teeth as as sort of uh, as, as prosthetic, but that give enhanced power. Uh, yes. They're not they're not normal teeth. <laughs> they're magical teeth. I mean. Uh, and they're very magical. revealing of his nature. They're very revealing of his nature. Yeah, yeah. and um, and and they are threatening, and they do damage, and um, you know they are, they don't reveal what they really are about. Uh, all sorts of things that fit with Carker's personality. It's so. really you know Dickens at his powerful best. You know, it's, yeah. yeah. That's it. All right, so we do have a number of comments in the chat. And let's see if I can navigate this. Let's see. Um, okay, let's. Um, okay, so Tim, way back. Uh, about an hour ago had mentioned, um, uh, had asked, is there any documentation where um, Brown reveals his intentions with all the subtle insertions in, in these illustrations? Um, did he do this on his own or did he have suggestions and directives from Dickens? We have Dickens's correspondence with Brown. We, uh, much of Dombey and Son was written when Dickens was on the continent. And I'm looking at the chat, Tim's question about the illustrations and the, the answer in so far as I know is that we, because Dickens was uh, in Switzerland and in France during much of the composition of Dombey and Son, he had to give instructions to Brown in writing, and so many of those letters are preserved. We don't have Brown's responses to, to Dickens. Um, so we, we don't know as much about what Brown was intending. We have to infer his intentions from the illustrations and then read them in, his, uh, uh, in relation to Dickens's suggestions. So I'm going to scroll quickly through the chat just to, Withers is, a, is an apt verb. Yes. Carker and Iago. Yes. <laughs> natural and unnatural. Um, see an essay by C.S. Lewis. Okay. Uh, um, Carker's oiling his way is always disturbing, but praise be to Dickens that he gives hints that good mother Brown and Alice will bring Carker's downfall. Wait, tune in next month. Uh, I never thought the, Kevin says, I never thought the marriage was consummated. I'm of that opinion myself. Carker is a bully, a rapist, and a sybarite. Edith's reaction to him is fear, not sexual attraction. I, I, I would say it's a mixture of, um, uh, of, of fear, repulsion, and, and a strange kind of attraction. Dickens, there's a phrase that uh, Forster uses about Dickens, and it's the attraction of repulsion. And I, th I think that Edith's response to, to Carker is the attraction of repulsion. Um, she, 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 you know, when he kisses her hand, she lets him kiss her hand, and then she takes her hand and strikes it on the mantelpiece on the marble, and her hand is is damaged as a, as a result. Um, it's it, when, when um, one, of, one of the th scenes that struck me in my reading uh, uh, of this section very recently w was the scene where uh, Carker leaves the house um, before the thunderbolt and uh, Edith has gone out and she's not home by one o'clock. She's not home by two o'clock, three, four, five, six. Um, and 
Florence is wandering around the house at night, wondering where Edith is. And then she sees a male figure and she thinks it might be her father, but no, it's Carker. And Carker at four o'clock or five o'clock in the morning comes stealthily down the staircase and goes out the front door and no servant is there to let him out. Um, where has Carker been? He's been closeted with Edith. He's been in her rooms with her. Uh, is this another suggestion? Or do we as readers? That's what they have been doing. Um, you know, it could be just that they're plotting the the, the elopement or whatever we want to call it. But um, anyway, uh, so Edith's birth control is going to Florence's room at bedtime. I love that. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure that a wedding was so different from then to now. I know from studying Jane Austen. Um, Well, one of the things we have not talked about, we're almost out of time, is what Florence is trying to do during this entire section. And, you know, F Flor Florence is trying so hard to find love, to find her father's love, to preserve Edith's love. Harker has been brilliant in driving a wedge between them. Um, and Florence's situation, we could analogize to that of the child of divorcing parents, because that's essentially what uh, uh, what the situation between Dombey and Edith is. Is they are, she she requests a separation, and he refuses it. Uh, but the child, in the middle of a divorce, wants the parents to stay together, feels that if the marriage is not working, that it's the child's fault. What has she done to cause this rift between, uh, between Dombey? And so, uh, and then at one point she even has the thought, she, Florence has interesting dreams and fantasies. And one of her fantasies is that her mother, her own mother, her birth mother, Florence's mother, died because Dombey didn't love her. And, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, something we don't know a lot about. What was that first marriage really like? We know that there was a letter that was found in the original Mrs. Dombey's room that she preserved from a love relationship that she had with someone before Mrs. Dombey, before Mr. Dombey. Um, so that's another marriage in the book that we just don't have much information about. It produced two children. Um, we have a question from Megan. Just to, no, it's a comment, and it goes back to Tim's original question about the illustrations. There's a very old article by Michael Steig. We're doing Martin Chuzzlewit in our fellowship, and I found this, and it's Progress by Dickens and Fizz, and it, it talks about Fizz's contributions to the Martin Chuzzlewit, but it has farther implications. So um, maybe if you like, I can put in, in chat the... Um, the info. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I mean, Steig is, is one of the best people um, who's written about the illustrations. And is he related to William Steig, the children's book illustrator? I, I don't think so. Uh, oh, man. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> and the New Yorker cartoonist also. Yes. Uh, but no. Uh, why am I? Yeah, Michael, Michael Steig 
uh, wrote a book called Dickens and Fizz. That okay, is, so that, so, yeah. Um, All right. And, and the article that you mentioned is probably uh, incorporated into the book. I, I got it on Jay's store. Okay, I'll, I'll look for it. What's the title again? You, you put it uh, in the chat. Orrin Chuzzlewitz Progress by Dickens and Fizz. But I, I was successful in pushing right. the, uh, the uh, citation. Great, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're out of time. So thank you very much for tuning in and I'll see you next month when we finish thank up. You. Thank you.